Hey Corey, thanks for your video about uh, Baroque Spinoza. And right off the bat, um, I have to admit that I haven't read a single word of uh, Spinoza's writing himself. Um, you know, I've come across his ideas um, many times, though, in, in my other um, research. And I'm a fan of any uh, so-called heretic any unorthodox thinker uh, who forces um, the rest of the intellectuals uh, of their age uh, to, to rethink the uh, habitual categories they're used to thinking in. And the idea of a spirit-nature divide, which has been so popular in the history of both Greek philosophy and Jewish and Christian theology um, is rethought. Uh, this dualism is rethought by Spinoza. Um, I'm not even sure of the specifics of how he you know, sees the appearances of mind and matter uh, as part of a single substance, that being nature. But um, maybe, you know, Corey, you can give us a little bit more detail. Um, tell us more about the way that Spinoza's metaphysics is able to heal this apparent, apparent ontological rift between um, spirit and, and flesh and uh, God and God's creation. But pantheism does offer us an interesting uh, way of rethinking the normal dichotomy um, that is discussed so much, uh, or that is evidenced so much here on YouTube. I don't think many discussions take place. Um, I'm talking, of course, about the atheist theist uh, debate. Instead of looking at, at, at uh, our situation in one or the other of these ways, we could we could consider pantheism. And from a pantheistic perspective, uh, there is an absolute, and it is what we are. And the universe is is whole in that sense. And um, you know, Einstein was uh, a Spinozan. Or Spinozian, um, and you know Einstein would say that all space and time exists now. The universe is eternal, has no beginning and ending. And you know, this is why Einstein fudged uh, his equations with the cosmological constant to avoid the inflationary implications. Uh, you know, of course, because of empirical observation, you, you had to. Correct Einstein's uh, fudging. The universe is actually expanding, and so, you know, some would say that it's not eternal, therefore, and, and that Spinoza and, and Einstein were, in fact, wrong about that. Uh, but there are still ways of, of preserving this notion of, uh, of an eternal universe, and I think that, that intuition, uh, I have that intuition as well, that something is eternal, but I also have the intuition. Of a radically historical process, which which is going on. So, you know, if, if we if we think about this uh, in terms of you know elementary physics, though, for there to be expansion that we observe, there must be some sort of contraction going on somewhere else, right? Um, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? So. Something must be prior to uh, this expansive, uh, inflationary, and, and creative, and teleologically creative process. I think that's observed as well, um, which makes me think of another um, heretic, Théo de Chardin, who was both a priest and a paleontologist. Which again, uh, 
forces us to reconceive of in one of the ways we might want to divide religion and science. And for Tehard, instead of thinking of nature and God as synonymous, uh, nature is an evolutionary process of increasing complexification which is correlated with increasing consciousness. And in fact, it's the desire of the interiority of, of material bodies, which drives these bodies to complexify in various ways. Uh, you know, hydrogen atoms are very limited in the ways they can complexify, but they do complexify, um, creating stars and uh, supernova, which develop into solar systems, uh, which eventually produce life, um, which then continues to complexify and evolve upon itself. Um, and so for Teilhard, the, it, it's not that nature is God, it's that nature, as an evolutionary process, is trying to become God. And that eventually, at the Omega point, it will become God. Um, and, you know, for Tehar, that is the true incarnation of Christ into the flesh, when you know, the earth is somehow transformed into a nospheric divinity. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot to uh, be skeptical about. Uh, but, you know, there's also something compelling going on there. And for, for someone who, who is swayed by a pantheistic um, worldview, I think one has to ask, well, what is the place of evolution, cosmic evolution, and human evolution or, or human history in this eternal universe? Uh, is, you know, if, if anything that, that goes on in time, in, in terms of like a developmental process unfolding, uh, as if it were moving toward some final realization, uh, then certainly this pantheistic or uh, eternalist take on the universe has to be uh, contested, right? Because something must be changing. Something if something is evolving, if the universe itself is evolving, then it isn't complete and, and self-identical in that sense. It isn't all itself, but is still becoming. Uh, then what you what we have is not uh, necessarily God as equal to the universe, but God as uh, becoming more fully divine with and as the universe. Um, so this is a panentheism, and implied in this is, is that God, in fact, uh, transcends the universe in some important sense, even though God only has a chance to know itself if there is a creative expression pouring out of, of God. Otherwise, there's simply lonely divinity that can't even see or know itself. It needs matter to reflect its uh, its own divinity to itself. And hence, here we are, still trying to reflect even more intimately the image which was before the beginning. Um, in the Bible, it's called the Logos, and it works itself out in time until finally it uh, fully flowers as the human word, um, the light become flesh. So that's, you know, that's a theological way of looking at it. But, uh, What do you think?